Queen Victoria when she said, um, "We are, we are not amused." You see, like she has, she has, she has lots of selves. We are, we are not amused. But then, where, where she went wrong is that apparently everything happens in the past. So the person reporting can only be reporting on the past. So it wouldn't be, "We are not amused." It would be, "We were not amused." Is what she should have said. We were not amused. But in fact, the person reporting isn't the self. It can only be reporting on all the uh, neuronal patternings and activities. So she should have said, "They were not amused." And neither was I. My neuronal assemblies were in an uproar. I knew I was supposed to be just neural patterns, metaprograms, and Brock fictions. But in the end, I still felt that behind every theory and every metaphor, there still had to be a me. A room, partying neurons, a fiction. Why was I finding it so hard to accept that there was no me behind these metaphors? They all seemed to fall short of convincing me that that was all there was to being me. In spite of all the logical theories I'd heard, I still couldn't shake off the feeling that there was a deeper, real me. Call it a soul, an essence, a little geezer. I needed someone to explain why I felt this way. And I'd met that man. Some said the world's greatest living philosopher, the man who devoted his life to studying the self. I think the early Buddhist view was largely that much or most of the misery of human life resulted from the false view of self. We take the simplicity of the concept I and of the self and we just read it into reality. Derek Parfit of All Souls Oxford, as I hear it, it was like this. He used to, he used to clock in every day um, for 14 years, but all he seemed to do was just go into his room. I mean, the hope was he was thinking but it became a bit of a do a bit of a scandal people said well, shouldn't Derek actually do something I mean shouldn't he meet a student in the older lecture I don't know anyway someone's dispatched to tell him the uh, thinking and he said oh all right he said I'll, I'll write a book a year later he came out with this reasons and persons apparently this puts him up there with the big ones you know um, I don't know Plato Kant Nietzsche Heidegger all that remained was for me to go and see him. Buddha said, O oh brothers, there are actions and also there are consequences, but there is no agent. Uh, there is no individual, it is just a name given to a set of elements. So that, on that yeah. view, what we have to realize is that we don't exist. Well, that's unnecessarily paradoxical. We do exist, but I think what we need to discuss is not whether the self exists at all, Mm. But what kind of thing it is? Mm -hmm. um, what kind of thing is it then? Well, the main debates have all been about the question what makes it true that it will be me who still exists, say, in some time in the future? Or your example, what made it true that it was me who had that experience that I remember having? Mm -hmm. And there are many different views, perhaps the quickest checklist would be some people think it'll be me so long mm. as there's the same body that I'm really this body yeah. here. others think no no I go where my brain goes and so they think that if my brain was successfully put into someone else's empty skull yeah I would wake up in that other body um, yeah now that's one disagreement what would happen there others think that what I essentially am is a soul and so my soul could, say, be reincarnated in a different body, mm. or my soul could go to heaven even if my mm. body is destroyed. And then yet others appeal to memory and other psychological characteristics. On this view, if there'll be someone who'll remember these experiences, mm. then it'll be me. Mm. Um, so those are the four most obvious contenders there.
So what made me wake up as me was one of four things. It was either my soul, my body, my memories, or my brain. But how was I to decide which one I believed in? It's in imagined cases that these different views start disagreeing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've mentioned one already, mm -hmm. a brain transplant. Suppose each half of your brain is successfully transplanted into the empty skull of, let's yeah. call them, your identical twin siblings, so that the body is exactly similar. Well, two people would wake up. Each of them has half your brain, seems to remember living your life, is psychologically just like you. What happens to you? Now, some people say, well, it's death, you cease to exist. I think that's the right way to describe it. Um, it's not a regular form of it's death. It's not a regular form of death. Now, another way of describing it is to say, I would still exist, yeah. only now I'd have two minds and two bodies. But that really strains the notion of a person. I mean, suppose in my two halves I go off, live at opposite ends of the earth, meet the other half of myself Isn't many years later, I don't even realize that I'm talking to the other half of me. We play tennis, I think it's someone else over there, but actually yes. it's me. I don't think we could accept that. Well then, if we admit... Think, well, they're two me's, aren't they? One me went that way, one me went that way. While we're together, we're an us. Well, but they aren't one and the same person. Because there are two of them, okay? Yes. So if we admit that there are two different people, each of whom has half my brain and is yeah. psychologically just like me. If they're two different people, they can't each be one and the same person, me. It'd be absurd to suppose that I'm one of them and not the other. No reason to suppose that. So I think we should conclude, yes, neither of them would be me. I would cease to exist. Yeah. But the point is, my relation to each of them would contain everything that matters. Blimey. I couldn't quite understand why Parfit wasn't happy with there being two me's. I was doing my head in. What was wrong with having two copies? We can take one of the standard science fiction cases. We, we're called teletransportation, in which you imagine what yeah. happens. You go into a cubicle on Earth. Yeah. A scanner maps the state of all the cells in your brain and body, yeah. destroying your brain and body while it does it. Then the information mm -hmm. is beamed, say, to Mars, mm. where a, a replicator makes a perfect organic copy of your brain and body. Mm. Someone wakes up on Mars, yeah. thinking he's you, exactly like you in character memory. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Now, many people think that teletransportation is just the fastest way of traveling. You travel at the speed of light. Yeah. But others think, no, it's a way of dying. They, they kill you, and then on Mars they make a replica. They make someone who's yeah. exactly similar, but won't be you. Yeah. Now, many people assume that it is just a way of traveling. I mean, they follow Star Trek yeah. and so on. I think it's not too hard to show that you're making a mistake if you think, oh yes, it would be me waking up on Mars. Yes. And uh, one way of bringing that out is to take what I call the branch line case. Suppose I enter the cubicle again <laughs> on Earth. Yeah. Press the button, nothing seems to happen. Yeah. I walk out, what's gone wrong? Isn't working. Technician says, we've been having some trouble <laughs> says, with these machines. Yeah. Though it recalls your states accurately, it damages the bodies that it scans. In a few days, I'm afraid to say, you'll be dead. But don't worry, you on Mars will take up where you leap off. Your book will be finished, your children cared <laughs> for, all your ambitions will be fulfilled. Mm. Excuse me, I think something's gone wrong with your machine. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm very sorry. There, there has been a mistake. Um, a mistake. But uh, you have actually traveled to Mars. That's not me. It's just a large television screen. No, sir, that's you. I'm still here, miss. No. On Earth. 
No, there has been a mistake and there has been a delay, but you're going to be destroyed anyway in four minutes. But everything